Jeff, very soon. This is White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders suggests the president is also considering other ideas to tackle gun control. Watch. Does the president believe there should be an age limit for those who buy an AR-15? I think that's certainly things? something that's on the table for us to discuss and that we expect to come up over the next couple of weeks. The White House uh, getting into the conversation in a very meaningful way right now. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts joins us now from there. John? Harris, good afternoon. I can just see uh, coming down Pennsylvania Avenue outside in front of the White House is this protest that has been marching around Washington today demanding something to be done to end these school shootings. And an important data point, too, in your discussion on assault-style rifles versus handguns and, and which is deadlier, uh, keep in mind that in 2007, Sung Wee Cho at Virginia Tech used two handguns, a Glock 19 and a Walther P-22, and killed 32 people and wounded 17 others. So... Uh, any kind of gun in the hands of a person bent to do damage uh, can be an awfully deadly thing. The president, uh, with a couple of listening sessions to try to figure out what to do to curb this epidemic of uh, school shootings in the United States and other mass shootings as well, uh, he, he's meeting tomorrow with uh, state and local law enforcement leaders and state officials to try to figure out from a law enforcement perspective what can be done. This afternoon, 4.15 in the state dining room, he's going to meet with students, parents, and teachers all of whom have some sort of connection to either school violence or gun violence. About 15 to 20 students, parents, and teachers from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School will be here, in addition to uh, members of the Sandy Hook Promise, that is parents of uh, students who were killed at Sandy Hook Elementary in 2012, as well an organization called Rachel's Challenge, which is dedicated to reducing school violence, and parents, students, and teachers from the local Washington, D.C. area and surrounding areas of Maryland, Virginia, who all have some sort of connection to school violence. Uh, yesterday, the president took action falling out of the Las Vegas attack that you see on the right-hand side of your screen back on October the 1st, in which uh, a gunman killed 58 people, the POTUS, uh, the POTUS, the president, directing Attorney General Jeff Sessions to look into whether so-called bump stocks or slide fire mechanisms should be banned. Those bump stocks allow a semi-automatic semi rifle to fire at the rate, uh, near the rate at least, of, a, of an automatic rifle. Listen to what the president said yesterday. The key in all of these efforts, as I said in my remarks the day after the shooting, is that we cannot merely take actions that make us feel like we are making a difference. We must actually make a difference. Harris, as you pointed out at the top, the president also weighing a number of other options, including raising the minimum age for buying a firearm. Current federal law, people cannot buy a handgun from a licensed dealer until age 21. They can buy what's called a long gun, a rifle or a shotgun. That would include a, an assault-style rifle when they're 18. If you're buying from an unlicensed individual, there is no minimum age to buy a long gun. A study that was cited by the Giffords Law Center found that one quarter of violent gun offenders would have been prohibited from obtaining a firearm if the minimum age was 21. And Sarah Sanders yesterday also saying that the mental health aspect of this will be a big issue to discuss as well. Listen here. The president is uh, very focused on mental illness, working with uh, the Health and Human Services Department to determine uh, the best path forward on that and what is available and allowed under the law. Certainly something that we take very seriously and something that we want to address and that we're working um, hand in hand with both uh, the federal government as well as state and local law, official, law enforcement officials on what we legally can do. And the president has also come out in support of a bill sponsored by Senator John Cornyn of Texas and Chris Murphy of Connecticut that would give incentives to state and federal agencies to do what they're supposed to do anyways, and that is report information up to the NICS system, the National Instant Criminal Background Check. Harris? John Roberts, thank you very much. Uh, we are awaiting that news conference now in Florida to begin. We should tell you that Florida Democratic Senator, uh, it's a state lawmaker there, Laura, uh, Lauren Book, rather, has helped organize this. She will be with the students. And just moments ago, some of those Marjorie uh, Stoneman, Stoneman Douglas. Douglas High School students who just arrived there were at the lectern. They have now walked back a little ways, and you're seeing some of the local officials speak at this open rally. So it isn't just the students uh, from Parkland, um, but they are there now to head up a news conference. When that happens, we'll take you there live. Uh, you know, Kennedy, 
presidents can weigh in in a lot of different ways in this instance. But when you see an enumeration, a list from President Trump in terms of making changes, what crosses your mind? It's really interesting because, uh, you know, for all of his flaws and, you know, a, a lot of Democrats say he doesn't have carved out policy positions. But that's when the fact that he's a bottom line president and more malleable makes him more amenable to bipartisanship. And, you know, here you have uh, that bipartisan bill, co-sponsored by a Republican from Texas, mm -hmm. uh, John Cornyn, and I think the president will be more open to that. Yes, he's got a huge endorsement from the NRA, and he, he understands the value and importance of the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. His sons are avid hunters, but also he's from New York City, where a lot of people feel safer because there are strict gun laws. And in that, I don't think he has as much of a carved out position, but unlike like presidents before point. him, uh, President Obama always gave a lecture but didn't really do anything, and other presidents have been hesitant to really lay out specifically and bullet pointed detail, uh, forgive that, that wording, what exactly they would do in terms of gun control, and this president has been bolder in that regard. It has remained a, what we call sometimes, a third rail issue, uh, and there are many of those, uh, social, cultural issues, but you're right, I mean, and it, w we've seen, I would say, tipping points already. Yeah. Right. We've had other tipping points. But Columbine, a tipping right. point. I want to comment on the legislation that we're talking about and remind people what that actually means. The Cornyn bill would make it uh, mandatory by law for states to input mental health records into the national background check system. Right now, now that not is, that is not the case. The Navy Yard shooter, he was committed in New Hampshire. His records weren't put into the background check system federally. He went to Virginia, bought a shotgun, passed a background check, and carried out the Navy Yard shooting. This bill would require, by law, incentivize states with some kind of funding to put those records into um, into the background check and, system. And make to that next system more, more accurate. Right, and I want to point out, too, law. that it is uh, pro-gun National Shooting Sports Foundation and the NRA who have been working for a decade to try and get this kind of legislation through Congress. It isn't the anti-gun people who have tried to make sure that the mental health records are put into the system, yet they are the ones who are accused all the time of not being for gun safety and new measures well, that can actually got, prevent there's the shootings. Other, another side of that story, which is that President Trump just undid a regulation put in place by President That's Obama not true. One, that it's said, not true either. Well, well, if you let me finish, I mean, what <laughs> I he what said is say, that under social, if you get social security disability payments or you can't handle, it's determined that you can't handle your own finances, that you should be not able to get a gun. He undid that. So this is part to me of is this president, and he says he's willing to take the you heat. Got to talk quickly here. Is he to willing to take the heat from the NRA? Are politicians who are seen as being bought by the NRA finally willing to say enough? All right. Uh, the Florida Democrat that I was telling you about, Lauren Book, is at the lectern right now. We understand that the first person to speak for Marjory Stoneman Douglas High School will be their junior class president. So we are watching this live play out. She has been very vocal and has helped organize a lot of funding coming in uh, from Democrats across the country in particular uh, to pay for. I know I had a lot of questions yesterday, who's paying for the buses, so on and so forth. There, there are community uh, dollars coming in, but also some political dollars coming in well as well. Uh, so we're getting ready to watch this, and they will tell me in my ear when we are ready to take this. The junior class president, again, will be the first of the students to speak. Let's watch. Good afternoon, everyone. First and foremost, I just want to thank you all for joining us here today. Um, in the wake of this horrible tragedy, we grieve. We cry and we deny that just seven days ago, 17 members of the Stoneman Douglas family had their lives taken from them in a matter of minutes. But within this past week alone, a movement has begun, a movement that demands change at a state and national level. Um, I would just like to thank Lauren Book and everyone who assisted me in making this trip a reality because I designed this in order to allow my, the voices of my classmates to be heard. Um, so without further ado, I just want to introduce Lorenzo Prado. He's the first student that's going to be talking. So Lorenzo. Oh no. <laughs> um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Lorenzo Prado. Um, I am a junior, and um, 
I do not support any political party, and I'm a survivor of the Douglas Massacre. I am here today to advocate for stricter gun laws on behalf of the 17 whose lives were ripped away from them on the day of February 14, 2018. On the day of love, our loved ones were ripped away from us in a horrific manner that should never transpire. Many would like to blame this event on the FBI's lack of action or the Trump administration. But the simple fact is that the laws of our beloved country allowed for the deranged gunman to purchase a gun legally. The law has failed us and, let, and has let the events that happened in Parkland to occur. And what we must do now is enact change, because that is what we do to things that fail. We change them. To not change the law in our time of need would be a huge disservice to the 17 dead in Parkland the 13 dead in Columbine, the 26 dead in Sandy Hook, the 50 dead in Orlando, the 59 dead in Las Vegas. For the good of the students, the parents, the family, and the country, we beg for common sense laws that will prevent a terrorist, because that's what he is, a terrorist, who invokes terror upon students and everyone upon the nation, to prevent someone like him from ever holding a gun ever again. On that fateful day of the Douglas Massacre, we lost our future because in those lives lost lays the future of our country. On that fateful day, we lost Peter Wang, a JROTC member and a hero. He was seen holding the door open for other su students to enter for safety. On that fateful day, we lost Coach Feiss, a football coach, a security guard, a hero, and a role model to his child. He was seen sacrificing his life so another could live another day. On that fateful day, we lost Coach Hickson, a wrestling coach, a security guard, and to me, a hero. He was seen leaving the auditorium to check the other's well-being because he put others' lives before his. On that day, we lost Nicholas Dort, captain of the swimming team, and he, a hero, and suit to be Olympian. Nicholas Dorit was seen pushing another student out of the way when the terrorist shot into his classroom. But I do not want to remember Nicholas Dorit as the man that met his death too early, because to me, Nicholas was a friend and my captain. He was the heart and soul of the swimming team, both in and out of school, because he was friendly to all and mean to none. I had never seen Nick frown, because he was, he was always optimistic in life. And every time I saw him, he had a smile. He had a smile when we were competing. He had a smile when I taught him Spanish. He had a smile, even something he dreaded so much, like math. I taught him math, and he would never, never frown. And, and before the week of that fateful day last week, the week before that, Nick had his own fateful day. The week before that, I saw Nick get signed into UND for swimming so he could chase his dream of becoming an Olympian. But that is a dream he can no longer achieve because Nicholas Cruz apparently decided to take Nicholas Dort's life. But we can't just blame Nicholas Cruz for this tragedy because the laws of our country allow him to purchase a weapon. Nicholas Cruz was able to purchase an assault rifle before he was able to drink beer. Nicholas Cruz was able to purchase an assault rifle, although he had clear signs of mental illness. Nicholas Cruz was able to purchase an assault rifle with clear signs of delinquency from the school. Nicholas Cruz was able to purchase an assault rifle with the intention to kill. On that day of the Douglas Massacre, I was a victim like everyone else. My peers dead, many performing heroic acts in their final hour, and I was scared like everyone else. But my case was different than all the others because on that day, I was a suspected school, school, school shooter. On that day, I was in the sound booth inside the auditorium. When the, fire, when the fire alarm rang, I decided that I would stay behind because what could possibly go wrong? I then hear the banging on the doors on the of the auditorium and I run downstairs to see a hundred people banging on the door. I quickly open the doors to let the people in, and I see my coach, Hickson, running inside for safety. I, I was scared, and I ran to the safest place possible, which was the sound booth again. 
and I start to pace back and forward because I did not know what was going on. And the people in the audience saw me. They saw me and they panicked because I was matching the same description as Nicholas Cruz. I had the same clothes, same color, same facial structure somewhat. I don't, and, and they reported me. And I was just hiding up there. I had no idea what was going on. And then the door started to rattle. And at first, the only thought that came to my mind was, I'm going to die. The shooter is going to kill me. But then the SWAT comes in, and I thought they were here to rescue me. But then as I go down the stairs, I find out that I was wrong. I found out that they thought it was me that killed the 17 people. And I, as I go down the stairs, they tell me to put my hands up. And I, being the fool that I was, tried putting my phone back in my pocket. And they demanded again, and I'm not trying to be one of those news stories of someone dying wrongfully because they didn't refuse to put their hands up. I just, I just dropped my phone at that moment and kept going. When I went out those doors, I had six SWAT members pointing their guns at me. I was, I was tossed to the ground. I was unjustly cuffed and held at gunpoint for, for the degrading and depreciating action of the disturbed individual, Nicholas Cruz. I was then put in a corner with a policewoman guarding me for the rest of the evening. I knew any move I made would be the end of my life. Throughout the entire event, I only felt two things. I felt fear as I did not know my future. I did not know if I was going to be let go. I did not know where the terrorist was. I did not know where, how my friends were doing, and for that, I was afraid. The second thing was guilt. I felt guilty for closing the door behind me. I felt guilty for startling the audience. I felt guilty for the SWAT who had to pursue me instead of pursuing the murderer. I felt guilty for not contacting my mother. I felt guilty for Coach Hickson, whose life I thought I saved when, I, when he walked inside the auditorium, but whose life was ended when he walked out again. <sighs> but guilty, I shall feel no longer, because I am here to demand change from our government, because the lives lost who shall not be lost in vain shall then be used as a catalyst for change in our country today. We will make change in this country, and if not today, tomorrow. And if not tomorrow, the day after that, and the day after that, until we achieve the change that we want in this country. <sighs> until the day that safety is preserved in all schools in our beloved country of America, we students will keep fighting for our right to live. If I had to drop everything else in my life, just to make these changes happen, I will, because to me, to let these victims' lives be taken without any change in return is an act of treason to our great country. To let our fellow countrymen to fall beside us without a fight back is to me equal to leaving a soldier to die in the battlefield. This is an injustice to our country, because not only of the lives lost, but also in the loss of confidence in our government. We lose confidence in our government because we are told that nothing can be done time and time again. And we are tired of hearing that because we know there can be change in this country. Never again should a tragedy of this caliber happen in this country. Never again. And as always, be positive, be passionate, and be proud to be an eagle. I have Ryan Dyke um, with his speech. I apologize to everybody who made their way here. I do not have an actual written or prepared statement, uh, but I am the president and founder of the MSD Improv Club, so hopefully I get something in. Uh, <laughs> Ryan, what's your, what's your last name again? Deitch. Ryan Deitch, D-E-I-T-S-C-H. I'm. 
uh, what, what can I say? What, what can I say that everyone else hasn't already put so eloquently, that all my fellow students have surprised me with? For the longest time, I've only perceived Douglas as a school of just entitled children and those who jewel. And now I'm, I'm left thinking that these are powerful speakers. These are, th this is the future. I've seen before me, my friends, people that I've known since even third grade have been standing next to me and have been speaking out against what is wrong. And what is wrong is that the life of innocence is being taken day after day after day. And it does not matter what we say. It does not matter how many people die. P the legislature, those in power, have not taken action. They've been using their words, they've used political double talk as much as they can, and it's not a weapon that I want them to be able to use anymore. They can walk around any question they want, but the more they don't act, the more they don't deserve to be in office. The more that I know, me and my friends, we, we are turning 18, I am a senior, I'm 18 myself now, I can vote and I know who I'm not voting for. These people that I've been meeting with, these people that I've seen, none of them have really put it into words what needs to be done. And I will say that I am a high school senior. I do not know the exact course of action to take. I do not know exactly what needs to be done. I just know what we're doing now is nowhere near enough. If I have to keep seeing neighbors die, if I have to keep seeing friends die, and I have to keep seeing other people on the news deal with this same tragedy, they do not deserve this. America does not deserve this. Humanity does not deserve this. And I'd just like to go into uh, saying that we, that overall the media is doing their job and I appreciate it. But I'd like to say that during the time where we are going to funerals, where people are grieving, I know for a fact that yesterday I walked out of Carmen Centrop's funeral early because I cannot handle that type of grieving. I cannot handle being in there mourning over the loss of somebody that I have known for at least the past six years. And I'd just like to say that when I see a camera tracking me as I cry walking out of a church, that is not acceptable. That is just, that popularizes the idea that if these killers are out there, if they have these guns, they will use them to get on some leaderboard I saw this the next morning after the shooting. There was a top 10 shootings in America, and we were at number nine, I believe. There should not be some rating score. You should not be able to put in a name at the end of that to say that I'm the one who shot up 19, I'm the one who shot 23, well, I shot 50. These people are looking for infamy. These people are going out there, getting attention, and America should not stand for that. I'd also just like to say, uh, overall, me and my friends, they, they have really shown me what we can do. They've shown me that everyone who's come out today, they are listening, that people are listening to this. And I'm so happy to see that people are listening, but they need to act and we need to act. And I know we have the school walkouts already being planned. We have the March on Washington, March 24th. but. I fear, after talking to representatives today, that that is not enough. That one trip to Tallahassee I knew was not going to be enough, but I don't know how many times I'm going to be having to come up here to just speak to have somebody to listen to me. I know I've been walking into office after office after office, and I've maybe only spoken to three representatives, two of which already agreed with me. I want to see those people who have spoken out against this. I want to see those people who shot down that bill, who did not let it get past committee. I want to see those people. I'm not here for a fight. I'm not here to argue with you. I just want to speak. I just want to see your face and know why. And thank, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'd like to introduce Alfonso Calderon. First and foremost, I'd just like to thank everybody for giving us this platform and Senator Rader from Parkland who came here. 
If there's one thing I want everybody here today to remember about this, is we're just kids. I know myself, I'm only 16. I'm a junior in high school. Most of my worries are, what show am I gonna watch at 6 p.m.? What, when do I do my homework? How do I fit in rehearsals for theater? I know for my other colleagues, it's sports or maybe film, but everybody needs to remember, we are just children. A lot of people think that that disqualifies us from even having an opinion on this sort of matter. As if maybe because we've been through a traumatic experience that we don't know what we're talking about, that we're speaking irrationally. And I want everybody to remember that is not the case. We, more than anybody else, understand the violence that comes through certain guns. We, more than anybody else, understand what it feels like to lose somebody. We, more than anybody else, understand what it's like to have a beautiful community like Parkland and have it taken away from us by the media and by everyone else and by Nicholas Cruz who just ruined its image. Parkland is a beautiful, safe town and it is now ruined. I know personally I'm probably going to live there for a pretty long time and it's not going to be the same. It's always going to be, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that you're from Parkland. I want everybody to remember, we are just kids. <sighs> Sorry, it's difficult to talk about this sort of thing because not only, not even more than a week ago, I was worried about a math test. I was worried about having a, a school show for the children in the, ele in the elementary school uh, just to road down. The way people today have greeted us, or not greeted us, as acknowledged by Ryan, is that we aren't being taken seriously enough. Now, I personally don't know the steps that we're gonna have to take, but once we figure that out, we're gonna take them, and you better believe we're gonna take them as soon as possible. That is absolutely abhorrent, to not even give it a chance to be discussed. That disgusts me. That disgusts my peers, because we know what we've been through, and we know that this needs to be changed, that there needs to be some solution here. We've had enough of thoughts and prayers. We've had enough of, we're in your consideration. We're going to think about it. We're going to tell you how we feel because we support you so much because we know that that is not true. If you supported us, you would have made a change long ago and you would be making change now. So this is to every lawmaker out there. No longer can you take money from the NRA. No longer can you fly under the...